My name is Bob Bruner. I'm the exotic forest pest specialist. I work in the Department of Entomology on Purdue's campus. Before I joined the Department of Entomology, I was also an extension educator. I worked in Clay and Owen counties, and most of my professional career, I have worked with a lot of different invasive insects. So I am an entomologist by training. I've had opportunities to study invasive bugs from the soybean aphid to spotted lanternfly and emerald ash borer. I was actually a part of the original research in Indiana that put out the big purple panel trap, some of you may have seen, to try to monitor emerald ash borer. And now I've gotten this position where I'm working closely with a lot of really, really smart, really great people in this field who are working very hard to create materials and to raise awareness about the potential dangers of these insects and other critters. Unfortunately, like Brooke pointed out, some of them are very, very pretty, but they do a lot of damage to our environment. Now, given that I am talking to the Indiana Native Plant Society, I wanted to talk about something that is not an insect, actually, that's going to be kind of important, and I've already been getting quite a few questions on. Now, before I get to that, there are a few things that I wanted to cover in this presentation, just real briefly. So first off, like this says here in front of you, there are a lot of invasive species that are threatening our state, either just outside of our borders or currently inside of our borders. And not all of them are insects, not all of them are plants. You're going to hear about different kinds of organisms like the hammerhead worm or the Asian jumping worm that I'm going to talk about. But no matter what, no matter where it, what it's called or who has it, all of these invasive species get here by one very, very similar means. And that is through us. We are the big drivers of invasive species entering our state, entering our country, and we move them around by our activity, by driving our vehicles, by shipping through Amazon or whatever carrier. All of these things can be very, very easily linked back to human activity. Now, the impact of an invasive species can vary. Your mileage will vary here quite a bit. But the biggest thing we've learned in all of our time, especially as we've learned from invasions by insects like emerald ash borer, is that a lot of those impacts can't be immediately understood. It takes time. And a lot of research and a lot of people out in the woods with a hatchet and measuring tools trying to figure out exactly the extent of the damage and how long it's going to last. So that being said, what I'm getting to is that there are a lot of questions that you may have, and many of them I may not be able to answer. I would need a crystal ball to be able to do so. But what I promise is I will do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. And if I don't know the answer, I always invite people to contact me, email me, and I will get you to someone who can answer it. All right, so let's get started on an invasive species. This is one you have probably heard a lot about. This is one you probably heard a lot about from me. I've written several articles on this. I've interviewed on TV on this one. I never thought I'd be working with a worm during my career, but here we are. This is called the Asian jumping worm. Now, the picture you see in front of you, and I apologize for the graininess of it, this worm is becoming a topic of a lot of conversation. It has been present in Indiana and the United States mainly for several decades, actually. And it's only recently had its population grow to the point where it's going to become any kind of problem. This is an annelid, meaning that it is a part of the same group that contains all the earthworms like night crawlers that you're familiar with. But there are going to be some very, very important differences between them. So the first one that I like to make sure I address with everyone is that when we say Asian jumping worm, we're not talking about a specific species. We're actually talking about a group. This is what we call a species complex that is made of worms from a couple different genuses mainly genus Amenthus and genus Metaphyre. They can occur in different populations and different combinations depending on the region the United States you're in. Now, we don't know for sure yet, but we believe that the species complex that we have present in our state is probably very similar to that of our neighboring states. These are worms. They're not going to move fast. They're not going to be able to spread in the sense of just mixing all together very quickly. Probably what we're looking at is species groups being individually transported and then spreading within an area after they establish. Now, a lot of people would look at this and say, well, these are worms, right? You know, worms are great for soil aeration. They can provide organic nutrients, that kind of thing. That's true for the worms that we have that have been here for a while now, which are our European worms. However, that's not true for Asian jumping worms. These worms offer no benefits to our environment. Now, I mentioned our European worms. I want to talk about those a little bit because that's actually an important distinction. So a lot of us may use the term native earthworms. 
but I have got some terrible news for you. We have virtually no native earthworms. Most of our worms are introduced. So what we have are worms that have been introduced throughout colonization and plant movement and other things. And for a long time, we actually didn't intentionally bring in worms at all. There was even a point where farmers felt that having worms in their field was a terrible idea. Uh, originally, we did have native North American species, but most of those were eliminated during glaciation. So when the glaciers covered Indiana, they scraped away the topsoil, which, of course, extirpated the worms that were living there. Now, if you collect a bunch of worms from out in the wild, you still can find a few of the natives. It's possible. But you've got to be a very experienced expert in the field to be able to identify them. And being someone who works as someone who identifies stuff, that is not an easy task. The European worms that we've been introducing ever since, through a variety of means, have filled that environmental niche up. They aerate our soil. They can increase the organic content within our soil due to their castings. And we use them for a variety of purposes, everything from composting, gardening, to even fishing. However, they could potentially be displaced by the Asian jumping worm now. If we look at one example of what's one of our, our quote unquote natives, the ones that, are, that we have introduced are European night crawler. This is one that a lot of us are going to be very, very familiar with. This is one that we grew up with when we were kids. We probably picked them out of soil. We put them on a fishing hook. We, we are very familiar with them. So a little bit of information on that. Let's just start a baseline for what we understand. So our European night crawler, which is going to be our, our example for our European worms, most of them do a very similar activity. They are surface feeding which means that they are going to consume food on the surface and they're going to burrow back down underneath it. They're primarily consuming leaf litter and other plant detritus from the forest floor. So they are one of nature's decomposers. That's how they're able to generate so much organic matter in their castings. They are breaking everything down for us. When they burrow into the soil, they go down fairly deep underneath and towards root systems of trees and other plants. And that helps create channels for gas exchange, air getting down into the tree roots, as well as water movement. These are great benefits. These actually enhance plant health and organizations like Purdue Extension and other extension services throughout the country actually helped farmers a very long time ago understand that and demonstrate how good worms could be. The last thing, the last bullet point you'll see here is I'm saying the castings are very rich and partially digested organic matter, meaning that when these worms poop, the poop is actually great for the organic structure of the soil. It will actually help you out quite a bit. Worms are great things to have. Now, another key fact about our European earthworms, this is going to set them apart from Asian jumping worm. Species of European worms possess both male and female organs on a single individual, so they're hermaphroditic, but they still need a partner to be able to reproduce. So keep that in mind. Yes, they are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female parts, but they do still need a partner for sexual reproduction. Individuals can produce 20 to 30 cocoons per year. So a cocoon for a European worm is a packet that contains all of their eggs, each cocoon containing about 10 to 12 eggs maybe per year, within a single cocoon. And then an individual European worm can live up to 10 years in ideal conditions, ideal in this case being more like lab conditions. I would probably cut a good chunk of that off if we're talking about in the wild, because life out in the wild has a high attrition rate. And that's going to depend on the species as well. But basically, what you're getting out of this is they can live for more than one year. They can live for several years. They need a partner to reproduce, and there's they can only put about 10 eggs in an egg cocoon. And they produce about 20 to 30 of those cocoons per year. So I've just loaded your brain up with all of that information. Now let's make some use of it. Let's show you why that information is important. So what is the difference? Well, there is a key point here. One, you can almost see it in this image. They will look different. This is an Asian jumping worm. It's going to have a few physical differences that are going to be noticeable, and I'm going to go over those in more detail in a moment. But the biggest difference is the ecology of the worm. What you are looking at here is soil structure after an Asian jumping worm population has been present. The soil is dried. It is almost devoid of nutrients and it has been turned into something similar to a consistency of coffee grounds. So not a very good situation for soil. A lot of our native plants won't be able to live in that. However, that's an ideal condition for plants that are meant to live in very, very poor nutrient situations, which typically are invasive plants. Another big difference is going to be their position in the soil and also why you tend to see this. So like I mentioned earlier, European worms tend to burrow deeply into soil and they surface to feed or escape water flow events such as rain. Like if you look outside this Thursday, we're predicted to get storm, you're probably gonna find some worms on your sidewalks. However, an Asian jumping worm 
they tend to only live in the first few inches of the topsoil. They consume the same thing. They're eating the rotting wood, the leaf mulch, the detritus, but they're only staying two to three inches on the soil surface. And then another difference is in their castings, all the poop that they keep generating. The European worm castings tend to be partially digested. They're going to have good organic matter and they provide a benefit. But that Asian jumping worm, its castings are very nutrient poor. That coffee ground texture you notice there in the, one of the earlier pictures, that's what they leave behind. They left very, very little there for the growing plants. And again, we can see it again with that information in mind. This is what the after effects look like. Well, let's do a quick comparison. So the image you're looking at right now is showing the line between where the Asian jumping worm population is and is not. If you're having trouble seeing it, let's add a helper. This red line you see here is delineating the difference between soil that still has good structure and plant detritus on its surface and comparing that to soil that's right next door to it that's been attacked by Asian jumping worm and has virtually no detritus left on it. That's the effect Asian jumping worm has on soil. That's why I'm here this evening, making sure that you're all aware of it, because that's not a situation you want to see. Now, I talked a little bit about the reproduction of European worms. A lot of you may wonder why I bother going over that. Well, it's actually important because this is a big difference between how Asian jumping worms and European worms live out their lives, and it matters in how we try to manage them. So in Asian jumping worms, the adults in theory, should be only able to live for a single season, and they will not survive after the first hard frost. So they can't overwinter in our state. They will not get multiple years. However, as we begin to warm up, we are already seeing evidence that these worms are beginning to have a new life cycle, where they're getting in multiple generations in a year. Now, their cocoons, those egg packets, they lay those during the fall and winter, and that's what overwinters in the soil. So the worms will last up until September, maybe even into October, depending on the heat, and then they'll die off, but their eggs will be left behind, and those will be safe in the soil. Trouble is, trying to find those egg cocoons is impossible. They kind of resemble a grain or a seed of mustard, like a mustard seed, and you can barely tell them apart from the soil at all. You'd have to take way too much time to be even able to try. Now the eggs will begin hatching once temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees and the adults will develop within 60 days. However, I have already gotten reports from Monroe County that they have adult Asian jumping worms and that they have been associated with compost and other spots that were covered with straw to protect them during the winter season. So we are now beginning to see that the eggs are hatching much earlier and developing much quicker than what they should have been. Technically, we shouldn't be seeing the first adult Asian jumping worm until like the end of June, and you can't identify them until they're adults. However, we're getting them already, so this will be a busy year for them. Now, I kind of went over this a little bit already. I mentioned the Asian jumping worms aren't suited to surviving Midwestern winters. Hopefully, that will remain the same. The trouble is, if you guys recall, we barely had a winter. We got a few really hard cold snaps, that did some pretty significant damage to a lot of plants, but we didn't really hit what I would call a traditional Indiana winter, and we haven't for some time. Now, some of the good things about Asian jumping worm is that they tend to go through boom and bust cycles. They overpopulate and then their population crashes because they consume the food in an area. So that may actually help us monitor and control them a little bit easier or they'll self-control because their populations can't support themselves. I've seen some evidence that they need very, very high nutrition soils to be able to last. And what they'll do is they'll exist at that interface between urban forestry, which is why I'm talking to you about them, and landscaping. So that way they're going to enter landscaping and gardening areas where we have higher nutrient soil and they're going to take advantage of that. And the, the key thing here too is that as our climate begin, continues to shift and as climate change becomes more and more impactful, we're going to see more than just the one generation per year. Right now, if I were to guess, we're going to get three generations in this year, but that's just me speculating. Now, the most important thing I want all of you to keep in mind is how we can identify them. This way, you can help us identify them and report them so that way we know where they are in our state because we are still trying to sort that out. Now, first off, take a look at this image. You are seeing on the left a European nightcrawler and on the right an Asian jumping worm. Note the color differences. Note the differences in the way their skin looks. Now, the reason for this, European worms tend to remain moist they are always kind of slimy if you ever handle them. Whereas Asian jumping worms tend to be scalier, they're drier, 
Their skin may even have an iridescent quality to it. Asian jumping worms can reach approximately six inches in length, but I shy away from using length to try to identify these. We're, we're looking at a species complex, more than one species, so that means that length may vary quite a bit. One thing they do, though, and you'll notice this, is that Asian jumping worms are aptly named. They thrash like snakes. That's actually why they're called a variety of names from Alabama jumpers, crazy worm, snake worm, amongst a variety of other things. By the way, they're often sold for vermicomposting under those names. So if you are doing composting and you see someone's wanting to sell you worms, you need to find out what worms are talking about. And I've seen a lot of websites that try to justify using Asian jumping worm to uh, sell to people for composting. So be very, very conscious of that. And if you are not sure, contact your extension educator and they will help you figure that out. Now, one of the easiest ways to identify the differences between the worms is the position of one of the organs that they have called a clitellum. This is the spot where all of their reproductive organs are contained. And I'm going to show you guys what to look for here. So right now, what I've got highlighted in those red circles on there is the clitellum on a European worm and on an Asian jumping worm. On the European worm, what you're going to see is that they're going to have a reddish brown saddle shaped clitellum that's kind of like a cuff around a portion of its body. It won't fully wrap around and it'll be raised off of the surface. The Asian jumping worm, however, its clitellum is going to be very pale by comparison and it's going to be flush with the rest of the body. So let's go back to that image for a moment so you guys can look at that again. So on the left, that's our European worm. You can see that's a little bit raised. The color is not too different from the rest of the body, but you could definitely see there's something different there. Whereas on the right, that's the Asian jumping worm. You have those pale, milky colored segments, but they are flush to the body. There is no raised segment there. Or if you see a raised segment, it would be very little. That's one of the easiest ways. Another thing, and this one is a little bit iffy, but on an Asian jumping worm, that clitellum, those pale milky segments, tend to be closer to the head. Whereas on a European worm, they tend to be a little further back, almost to the midpoint of the body. Okay, so this is the part where you guys are probably not going to like me anymore. I'm talking about prevention, because unfortunately it means some things are, would have to change if you feel the Asian jumping worms in your area. First off, they invade through transport of soil and products that contain soil. Remember, these are worms. They don't run, they don't fly. All they can do is crawl and worms aren't exactly fast. So that means that we transport them. Potted plants, compost, mulch, soil from contaminated areas, all of these things are potential vectors for this worm to spread. And it is not an uncommon story in Indiana where if you are trying to get your garden back going, one of your neighbors brings over a pile of soil on the front loader to throw into your garden because that's what we do. We help each other out. Unfortunately, we got to quit doing that. Compost is one of the biggest issues that I have found so far in the work that I've been doing because I have been in conversation with multiple community gardens and they have all gotten infestations of jumping worm because of compost contributions from the people working on the garden. So if you are providing compost, you need to make sure that your compost is clean. Now I've added potted plants on here because during herb sales, herb markets, that kind of thing that we all tend to go to, especially those of us who are master gardeners, we need to be very careful about how we source these. If you don't know or trust the person who's selling you that, you need to treat it as suspect because it could be infested. And I would definitely encourage all of you to please use bare root plants. One of the things that my partner and I are doing is we are going through and replanting a lot of our yard because we're doing some new landscaping and we are trying to find as much bare root stock as possible. We're big rose growers here in my house, so we're looking for lots of bare root rose stock to use for knockouts to plant. We will be creating our own compost and that compost will not leave my property. I would encourage everyone that if you need to purchase compost or soil, you need to leave it in the sun for several days until it reaches 105 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature. You also need to make sure it's wrapped up so the worms don't escape. Over 105 degrees, the worms cannot survive and their eggs will die too. So that is actually fairly easy to accomplish, especially during the warmer days of summer. I would also just strongly encourage you to avoid transporting soil to your property that you haven't personally verified is free of worms. Now, that being said, you're gonna to wanna to know how to detect them when they're in the soil. So first off, I already showed you one way. Look for soil that resembles coffee grounds. It's gonna have a granulate appearance. It's going to be drier. It's just gonna feel almost sandier even, though it's gonna be a little bit more coarse than that. You can also check for worms near the soil surface because the worms are only gonna be in the first two to three inches of soil and they won't go further than eight inches. I'm actually surprised that someone found them as deep as eight inches. 
You can also perform what's called the mustard test. Now, this is a fairly easy test. All you have to do is mix together a third of a cup of ground hot mustard into one gallon of water, and then you can pour half of that volume slowly over a one square foot area. What this will do is it's going to be very, very repellent to the worms, and every worm will come to the surface of the soil. Now, that's important. It's going to get all worms, including the European ones. So if you're trying to find Asian jumping worm, you'll have to then go through and identify them. Now, how can we eradicate them if we do find them? This is the hard part. Since Asian jumping worm can be sold by people as bait and for vermicomposting, that means that they are not yet regulated. So there's no law preventing someone from taking them, from just selling them to you, transporting them, whatever. This also means that there is no chemical treatment labeled for them because they're not recognized yet as a pest. So please do not attempt to create a homebrew treatment because not only will you probably kill the worms, you'll kill everything else in your soil too. That's going to harm our native species as well as potential invaders. We are asking that you don't use any pesticides on them. Some people have found that they will get activity out of pesticides that will also affect the worms, but nothing is labeled for them, so don't do it. The worms can be handpicked and you can put them in trash or heat kill them. You can even use the heat killed worms for compost, but I want to stress you need to make sure they're dead before you decide to compost those. Compost or mulch can be spread in a driveway and you can handpick the worms out of them. However, it's important to keep in mind that the cocoons will remain in the soil and trying to identify them out of the soil is going to be a waste of your time. It's, they're just too hard to identify. Now, another option, of course, is that you could solarize soil. So if you've got compost or something you're not sure about, what you could do is you could fully enclose it in clear plastic wrap or black. I don't think there's a real good point in saying any difference between the two. And once you've got that kind of weird soil sandwich going, you can leave it out and solarize it, let it rise to a heat that's adequate. It's important that you have that full enclosure, though, because as the soil heats up, the worms are going to escape. That's why it's important to keep it fully wrapped up so that way you can prevent them from getting out of there and they'll all die in there. I kind of went over this a little bit already. Don't share plants from known contaminated sources. If you know someone has Asian jumping worm, uh, don't share them. Make sure you monitor really closely all the plants, all the compost, everything that is coming into a community garden. I cannot tell you how important that is because almost every single one I've talked to has gotten an infestation because of that. You can exchange plants from contaminated sources, though, if they are bare root or placed in some kind of sterile planting medium. Remember, these are worms. They need soil. If you get a plant and you rinse the roots and you place it in a sterile medium, you should be fine. They're not going to adhere to the surface of the plant. And of course, one of the things that I beg everyone to do is please educate, identify, and report. Please help us do this because unfortunately, there just aren't enough specialists like me. There aren't enough people in the Department of Natural Resources who work on this to go around. So we need your help in learning and identifying this and spreading our word on it. All right, that is what I had for Asian jumping worm. So I'm going to now go over what has been one of the things that I've had to focus on a lot in the last several months. Some of you have probably heard of this insect. It's had a lot of news spread about it. There was even a skit on Saturday Night Live about this insect, and it is the spotted lanternfly. It is one of our newest invasive species here in Indiana. Blessedly, it has not yet spread. So let's talk a little bit about what this insect is. So spotted lanternfly is a generalist herbivore. It's going to resemble very closely the cicadas we saw come up a few years ago. They feed in the same way. They feed using a rostrum, for those of you who are familiar with it. That's a set of mouth parts that's kind of shaped like a syringe that they'll put into the plant and they'll drain out the plant sap. They have been identified in two locations in Indiana. One of them is Huntington, Indiana, and the other one is in a rural area in Spotsylvania County. These insects are easily capable of infesting over a hundred different species of plants, native and non-native, and they typically are closely associated with Tree of Heaven because Tree of Heaven is their host in their native range. Fun fact, in their native range, spotted lanternfly is actually fairly rare. It's only when they arrived here with no natural predators or anything that they truly began to spread. Now, unfortunately, this insect has a cryptic portion of its life cycle, which means portion of its life cycle is very hard to detect. And I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. So one question I get quite a bit, of course, is where do they come from? 
These are natives of Asia, like many of our invaders. Like I said, they're very uncommon in their home range. We believe they arrived on imported stone product and they were first detected in the United States in 2014. And since then, they've rapidly spread. So what you're seeing here in this image is a stone that has the egg masses of spotted lanternfly. Those smears of mud, those are actually the egg masses. There are little, dozens of little eggs under there, probably about 30 to 40 in a given egg mass. That makes detecting them very, very hard if you're looking for these. So the this image right here that you're seeing now is what was actually done as a, a kind of a, an experiment, a projection of the most likely distribution of spotted lanternfly in the United States. So the green areas are the, or the white is the least likely, it's just unsuitable range for them, going through green and all the way to red. That red there is the area of highest probability for those to spread through. So guess where Indiana is? If you said it's right smack in the middle of the red, you would have it, unfortunately. We are one of the most ideal locations for spotted lantern fly to spread through. This originated in Pennsylvania when it arrived here. Now, it's actually gone a little bit further than what that spread map indicates. It's been identified in every county in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. It has spread very thoroughly throughout a good portion of the eastern seaboard. I actually have friends who live in New York, both the city and the state, who are just being driven crazy by these things. So unfortunately, we may be dealing with something similar here this coming summer. Now, like with our Asian jumping worm, I think it's the most important thing to make sure that you know how to identify these things when you see them. Now, the good news is they're very pretty, so they're very easily identified. You'll know what you're looking at. The adults tend to be a little bit smaller than a cicada. They're going to have these beige wings with black spots, and then the wings will be divided in half with that darker area. When you look at the hind wings, when their wings are spread, you'll see bright red and white which will make them very, very easy to ID. And it makes it so that they scare away predators too, because they are very distasteful. Their abdomens will have a lot of yellow coloration on it, though that may not really be noticeable unless you're looking at a female who has a belly full of eggs, but it is there. What I do want all of you to focus on, though, are going to be what we call the early and late instars. So an instar is a period of time in between molting when the insect is still young. So in this case, it's a nymph. It doesn't go through complete metamorphosis. Early in its life, it's going to be very tiny. It's going to have this black and coloration with white dots over its surface. For those of you who are familiar with them, it even may resemble a weevil a little bit. But that protrusion isn't a mouth part. It's just a protrusion that's associated with lantern flies that they lose as an adult. The later instars, however, will be the ones that you'll probably be able to identify very quickly. They're going to be bright red with white and black on them, white dots with some black coloration. This is how they were originally identified in our states. Someone posted in a Facebook group, I think it may have been, uh, it, it could have been an IMPS Facebook group, I'm not sure if I remember clearly, that they found a weird mutated lady beetle. Well, a lady named Ellen Descartes was looking at it and she saw it and she reported it to DNR because she recognized it as a spotted lanternfly. Now, one thing that will probably be the most challenging to identify are going to be the egg masses. You could try guessing how many egg masses are in this image. I think I counted out there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 of them. All of those smears of mud, all those cracked surfaces, those are all egg masses of spotted lanternfly. And if you see spots where it looks like there's a surface that kind of looks like the surface of like an alligator's skin, those are rows of eggs that just aren't quite as covered as all the rest of them. So you can imagine that this makes this insect very hard to identify out in the field. And a lot of our Department of Natural Resources staff work very hard to try to see them, but it's, a, it's an uphill battle and there just aren't enough people to go around. So what do they eat? Why is this insect so important? I mentioned that it'll attack over 100 plants. Now, it's not going to kill 100 different kinds of plants, but it will become critical on several of them, including grapes, vineyards, grape growers, wine development areas. Those are going to be suffering quite a bit because spotted lanternfly will outright kill grape. They will overpopulate the plant and drain it completely dry. So these are of critical importance to that area of agriculture. They will also attack American river birch, which is a common plant that we will see intentionally planted and out in the wild here in our state, as well as maple. Unfortunately, they will go after maple very readily. They may not necessarily kill it, but they will do significant damage. And Penn State, Extension has reported some research that shows that when spotted lanternfly consumes maple intended for syrup production, they'll ruin the quality of the syrup. They can also attack black walnut, which is a veneer tree of high value in our state. A lot of folks will plant this to create a retirement nest egg. They'll sell the black walnut as a veneer wood after they planted it years later. Black walnut, unfortunately, is also threatened by spongy moth as well as thousand canker disease. So this tree is in a lot of trouble right now. And of course, they will attack tree of heaven. 
this is their host plant. This is the plant they will always go after first. Now, some people have theorized, can we use Tree of Heaven as a trap? Because some of you may be aware, Tree of Heaven is dioecious, meaning it has male and female plants. And people suggest, well, can we just plant males to trap them? I'm of the opinion that we should get rid of all Tree of Heaven, period, because let's just get rid of both of these invaders. And I simply don't trust people to be capable of telling the difference between the male and female plants when they're planting saplings. So let's just eliminate Tree of Heaven along with it. And the one that breaks my heart the most is that they attack roses. I love roses. I grow roses here and they will kill roses. So that's a big disappointment to me. And then of course, like I mentioned, there are over a hundred more plants they will also attack. I don't bother remembering the list because that's quite big, but suffice it to say, we'll need to keep an eye out to see what they're going to attack and what's going to become critical in urban landscapes. So what's their impact going to be? when they do attack. So they're going to go after woody plants for the most part. And what you're going to see is signs of stress on those plants. They will lose their ability to store nutrients, which makes their seasonal regulation more difficult. Getting through winter when you have less food stored up is a lot harder. Some plants, they will reduce the growth. And like I mentioned, they're going to kill others like our grapes. So it makes them really, really important to watch out for in several agricultural areas. Now, a little bit of reporting. This was done by my predecessor, Elizabeth Barnes, on this one as she made her observations. It was not clear what their impact on fruit trees was. More recent information has since come out that shows fruit trees seem to weather these insects fairly well. Hopefully that will remain true. It will tend to cover crops in honeydew, which is a very, very nasty effect. Those of you who are familiar with aphids will be familiar with the effects of honeydew. Unfortunately, a spotted lanternfly will produce a significant amount of honeydew to the point that heavy infestations will make it look like it's raining honeydew. And that honeydew will fall on the understory. It'll fall on any ornamentals planted below and pretty much give a substrate that's going to allow sooty mold to develop and become really nasty. In the areas where they were working, they had to increase spraying because these insects do respond fairly well to pesticides. And they tended to prefer field edges, which is something that is very, very common with a lot of our invasive species. They will be able to cross field edges, habitat edges. But at the worst level of infestation, they were getting about 400 spotted lanternfly per vine on grapes, which is an infestation that is not survivable. I don't know how many of you live in northern Indiana, so the northernmost counties. I'm guessing probably not everyone here is. I'm guessing you're more closer to the Marion County area. So what this is, is this is a moth. It was previously known as gypsy moth. Entomologists, we at our own associations, we chose to rename this one because its name was problematic. And we came up with spongy moth because its egg masses are spongy. What you're seeing here is a caterpillar of this moth. Now, unfortunately, the reason why it's so important is because this caterpillar will just absolutely shred the leaves of many, many different kinds of trees. If you look in areas that have been infested with it, it's it's pretty bad. I've got a few images here I can share with you. So what you're looking at is, keep in mind the background of the image. There are lots of trees in the background that are fully greened out. And then note the trees that for some reason don't appear to have any green on them at all, or very little. Those trees were attacked by spongy moth. Now, unfortunately, spongy moth has established in Indiana, in our northernmost counties. And what we are working on right now is a um, suppression program to try to prevent this moth from spreading any further. Members of the Department of Natural Resources are working very hard right now to use several different management techniques to contain these to the areas that they are in. And they're doing a great job with it too, because so far there are no new outbreaks of this moth. Now, this is what an adult looks like. This is actually, I believe, an adult female. It's going to be a little bit largish, but it's not going to be like as big as, say, a sphinx moth. It'll be something like a moth you would see buzzing around your lamp in the evening, maybe a touch bigger on average. It's going. One of the things that I really like about it is those two dots you see on the wings there. Those remain very consistent across many of the adults, making it kind of easy to identify. But the larva is the one that's really super easy to identify. So if I go back to it, the larva, the caterpillar tends to have very bright red and very bright blue in that pattern. So that makes it super, super easy to tell where it is. And you will see them crawl up and down trees that they are infesting. There's actually techniques that you can try use to control them because they can you can put a burlap wrap around a tree that you can treat with like an oil or a sticky substance and the caterpillars will just crawl right into it. But unfortunately, it doesn't give absolute control. What you're looking at here, this is a caterpillar that actually recently molted. You can see its head's kind of big compared to the rest of its body. So it recently 
recently molted into its current instar. And these do chew on leaves. So these don't suck out juices from a plant. They will actually chew and shred the leaves of the trees that they're in. This is what the eggs look like. This is why they're named spongy moth now. The eggs are, the egg masses are very, very spongy, but that's good because it also sets them apart from everything else. These are very, very noticeable on the sides of trees. They aren't hard to identify. They're not cryptic like the spotted lanternfly is. The trouble is, is they can spread very fast and they can do a lot of damage very quickly, which is why they, this DNR works so hard to contain them. Now a little bit on their life cycle here. This one's pretty straightforward. The eggs are laid at the end of the fall season in October. They're going to remain on the sides of trees all the way through March, and they're going to hatch out at the end of March and begin growing in April through June. So that's when the biggest moments of control will be occurring because of the most sensitive to the control efforts. When they become adults, there's another type of control we can use that is called mating disruption. That's a technique where a chemical is released that imitates the mating pheromone of this insect. And we realize that if you release enough of it into the air, the moths become blind to each other and they can't find mates to reproduce. So they lose generations out of their year. Now, I mentioned before, these are located in northern Indiana in only a few counties, and you can see those highlighted under on this map right here. Christy made this one back in January, so this is an updated map. And like I said, Purdue University and DNR are working together to create a suppression program, but it's important to remember, we will not be able to eradicate spongy moth out of Indiana. It is a part of our ecosystem now. We need to just contain it where it is. I hope you will never ever see this one, especially those of you who are getting closer to central and southern Indiana. But if you see anything that resembles this moth, please immediately call that number or email me a picture. That way we can guarantee that it is not that, hopefully. That is what I had on spongy moth. We do have a few questions here. Joellen has asked, should the compost or the mulch that's being treated out in the sun to heat it up, should that be raked flat and not in a mound in order to evenly get that temperature increase? I would. I think that's a good idea. I mean, as long as you are wrapping it up thoroughly and heating it adequately, raked or in a mound won't make a difference because as long as the heat is penetrating all the way through, you should be able to kill them. But if you rake it flat and then cover that completely and leave it flat, it's going to happen much faster. Okay. And then what, I have this follow-up question to that. What happens to those worms if, if it's covered and they can't get out? What, do they just die in that heat? Yep, they will die. Now, yeah. they, according to the research that I've seen, their bodies don't contain any toxins. They're not disease carriers, nothing like that. And that temperature is adequate enough to kill their eggs as well. Okay. So at that point, they are safe to compost. But I want to stress again, you've got to make sure you kill them all if you're going to use them in compost. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Seth from Hancock County says, how do we report the presence of jumping worms? I'm pretty sure I encountered some in my landscaping this afternoon. Oh, Seth. Ooh, okay, Seth, so I want you to do this. So Brooke has my contact information. My email is rfbruner at purdue.edu. So you can send me a picture of that, email it to me. You can also call one 866 no exotic to report it, and that will take it to the DNR. And they have been getting phone calls about that. I'm actually going to put that number in here so that way you guys can see it in the chat if you download the chat. Now, I want to stress here, DNR can't do much about these worms because the worms are not regulated. DNR is a regulatory arm, and unfortunately, until the worms are declared pests and they get the proper labeling, they can't do anything other than just take down the information and try to track their spread. But if you call that number or if you email me, I will make sure that it gets reported into the right system so that way we can continue to track that spread. Okay, thank you, Bob. So from IWI, the question is asked, how do you treat spotted lanternfly? So spotted lanternflies, they do have a set of pesticides that are effective on them. I usually don't remember the list because the list is actually fairly large. It's one of the few blessings when it comes to spotted lanternfly. They do respond well to quite a few different insecticides. Now, when we're talking about treatment, normally what we would do is we would use a foliar application to kill the nymphs. And there are several that are labeled for it. That one, you can work with your extension educator to figure out which ones will work the best. And you can apply that to the nymphs. And then when we're talking about the adults, we have found that systemic insecticides, like a soil drench that gets taken up into the tree is effective at killing them. Now, that being said, 
a lot of folks have problems with systemic insecticides, and I understand them because it's an easy way to expose pollinators to them. But the way you treat for these will be in areas where you will either lack pollinators or it will be at a different time of year than when pollinators will be present. And the ones that you treat with, they are not, they don't have long residual. They will not remain in the tree system. I believe one that was noted for efficacy was a chemical called dinotefferin. There are also several others that are labeled for it. So I just want to stress that if you do treat for them, a lot of times when you treat for them, you will be able to easily avoid doing damage to pollinators. Okay, and thank you so much for, Bob, for that, Bob. And as always, we encourage people uh, when using any pesticide, herbicide, or insecticide to closely follow the directions in terms of how to use the product, how much to use it, and when to use it, and when not to use it. And so Brett now asks, the spotted lanternfly seems horrible with the devastation from the EAB seen every day. Why is spotted lanternfly not a household discussion? Just hope not looking at 20 million more dead trees, need to flood news, need pamphlets, at garden centers, et cetera. Agreed, Brett, thank you. Brett, if you are offering to help, I will happily accept it because that is almost the entirety of my job right now. The strange thing is, is that this has actually been one of the more widely noticed insects and people have been talking about it quite a bit. It, like I mentioned, it even got a spot on Saturday Night Live because it's something that sticks out. It's, it's noticeable, it's pretty, and it creates all that nasty honeydew that I saw people asking about. By the way, that exudate, that is, I I want to expand on that a little bit too. So what happens is aphids do this as well. When they drink the sap out of a tree or a plant, their bodies cannot process all the sugar and starch they just took in. So they have to exude it. They, they basically, they poop it out because the, if they don't, their bodies will toxify. And what happens is they have organs or they have their version of a rectum where it comes out and it just drips down whatever plant or whatever surface they're on. The reason honeydew is important is because it's simply, it's, it's very sugary. So it creates this great surface for sooty mold to develop on a plant, which will block out the plant's ability to perform sort of photosynthesis and a host of other problems. Another Another question. You talked about using sterile planting mediums. Can you talk a little bit more about what are sterile planting mediums? And then furthermore, when we are digging plants and sharing them and are concerned about the presence of the um, jumping worm, can we sterilize that root ball um, just like we sterilize our, our um, pruning tools with um, alcohol or bleach? Are there any best practices for that? So when I was referring to sterile planting medium, I was simply referring to a medium that is known to not be infested with any invasive worms or parasites or potential disease pathogens. So that's what I was intending from that one. Now, as for sterilizing plants themselves, like you would sterilize your tools, that one I'm not sure you can do because with our tools, we need to sterilize them using some kind of either abrasive or caustic chemical, like a, something that's intended to clean. But we can't really use a detergent or something like that on a root because then you're going to be destroying the layer of cells on the surface of the root. So you don't want to do that. What we can do, though, is when we're talking about Asian jumping worm, it doesn't adhere its eggs to anything. So you can rinse the root ball off. You can just rinse it off, maybe even soak it in a nice growing medium, some, uh, some version of miracle Grow or what have you. If the plant can stay in liquid for an extended period of time, these things can't swim and they need to breathe oxygen. So there are different options there that you could consider, but I would stress that it's going to depend on the plant and it's going to depend on what you have access to. The biggest thing is make sure the root, it's bare root and it doesn't have soil clinging to it. That's really what it comes down to. So when we're thinking about digging plants with INPS, we have the plant salvage team. We might need to think about having buckets of water that we can wash those root balls with then. Is that correct? Yes, but you do need to make sure that when you wash them, you don't just want to dump it out because if there were Asian jumping worm eggs there, you don't want to accidentally spread it somewhere. So you have to treat whatever you wash it in as potentially contaminated and have some kind of disposal process uh, waiting. Okay. Great. We really do need to figure out these best practices, don't we? And unfortunately, the research just isn't far enough along yet, quickly enough for us to determine those. Okay. What we really need is folks like everyone on here telling their local representatives to declare this a pest. So that way we can get those research dollars and get the information you need to manage them. Great point. Great point. Last question that I have here is, what are good resources for identifying these forest and environmental pests? So that is a great one. I've got something for that too. Great. All right. So the Purdue plant doctor, some of you may have heard of this one. 
I hope you've heard of this one. This is a website that was developed by one of my predecessors and one of my former supervisors, a professor named Cliff Sadoff in the Department of Entomology. This is the man who wrote the book on a lot of the insects that you have learned about, and he is such a great resource. He created the Purdue Plant Doctor to intentionally work on a mobile device. So you don't need to download an app. You don't need to do anything. You just go to purdueplantdoctor.com, like it says right there, and it will appear on your phone. And what you can do is type in descriptions. You can look through pictures. That way it'll help you identify your plant problems as well as locate those invasive species. Okay, great. That link is really easy. I'm just copying right now. That is purdueplantdoctor.com. Now I see IWI's question there about how to treat the, the eggs of spotted lanternfly. Yes, winter oil, soybean oil has been found to be effective at treating the eggs. So that is an option. And you're asking, do you delete the apps now? Um, that depends on your personal preferences. There are apps that can be handy. There are some that are not quite so handy. I, I like the Purdue Plant Doctor one, but I mean, I will still use a few different ones to help me out in the field. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to have multiple tools on your phone if you want to be using them out in the field for various purposes. I agree. Bob, as, as research is able to um, progress, Will, as um, part of the best practices kind of in combat with these pests, um, will there be a list of hopefully native trees um, and other plants that are not used or susceptible to these pests, like good replacement trees when you lose a tree to these pests? So here's the hard one about a lot of our insects that are coming in. That would have been true with emerald ash borer. That one was easy they attack ash and they don't really go anywhere else. Unfortunately, with most of the ones coming in now, they have multiple hosts that they'll take advantage of. As we discover the ones that they will avoid, we will definitely make sure we share that. And we will definitely try to make sure that we focus on our native plants most of all. But I don't predict that working out very well because these insects are generalists. They're able to adapt to new plants very easily and there's nothing to really prevent them from doing so. So we'll do our best to make sure you have information to try to figure out what you can replace with, but that may be a very, very small list. Understood. Bob will be looking for this information as soon as it comes out. So thank you so much. Okay, we have three minutes left. Left. So this is the last call for questions. Does anybody have any other burning questions for Bob while we have him here? I, this is Joellen again. I was wondering about the Asian longhorn beetle, which, you know, has been a problem in Chicago and I think in Cincinnati. And if we have any indication that it's crossed the borders. Uh, Joellen, that bug is my nightmare. Um, okay. So for those of you who are not aware, Asian longhorn beetle is another wood boring beetle, kind of like the emerald ash borer. Their families, the, the groups they belong to are very loosely related. That insect will attack just about anything it can in terms of trees. And even in its home range, it is an extremely damaging insect. Now, this one is, again, it's an invasive, the Asian longhorn beetle is from Asia. And like Joellen pointed out, it's been identified in a few places that are near Indiana. So far, to my knowledge, only two identifications of that insect have been made in our state. So it is not here yet, but it is also one of the most tightly monitored and controlled insects that we watch for now. You can actually find a map online um, that's hosted <laughs> by either the USDA or the Federal Department of Natural Resources that demonstrates the spots where it has been identified. And it even shows you how that insect was managed and what the state of its management process is. And every single one of them is either currently under control or has been eradicated. So hopefully we will never have to worry about it here in Indiana, but we are watching very, very closely because like I said, the damage that insect can do is just absolutely incredible. Okay, we'll keep our eyes out for that one too, unfortunately. Thanks for all the good questions, folks. We are hitting eight o'clock tonight. There's a little bit of sun left out there. So hopefully you get a few minutes to go take it in. My email I will post in the chat if you have any follow-up questions, bmalford at purdue.com. Reach out if you have any more questions or want to be connected to resources. Bob, thank you once again so much for being here with us tonight. I know you had a long day out in the field today. Hopefully a great day out in the field today and everybody else. Um, thanks again for being here. Thanks, folks. You're a great audience. We'll see you again one of these days, Bob. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye, everybody.